During World War II, the American military asked mathematician Abraham Walt to conduct a study to best ascertain how to protect airplanes from being gunned down. They knew armor would be of assistance, but the military couldn't protect the entire plane as it would weigh them down too much, thus depriving them of the very thing they were made for. That's right, Squire. Flying. At first, their plan had been to examine the planes once back from combat and assess where they had been hit the worst. In most cases, it was their wings, about the tail gunners, and around the center of their bodies. So the deductive conclusion was to reinforce those areas with extra armor. However, this is when Walt stepped in and pointed out their analysis was negating one crucial factor. They'd completely ignored all the planes that had failed to return. Had this not been observed, the military would have armored up the wrong parts of the planes, since the bullet holes they'd registered were from planes that had survived combat, thus indicating they didn't need reinforcing whatsoever. It was actually the parts unscathed they should have patched up, as I'm sure the not-so-lucky pilots of the obliterated planes would have attested to had they not plummeted to their most gruesome deaths. This, according to the history shit I googled, was the first recorded instance of the survivorship bias at play. In a nutshell, those who make it are given instinctual preference over those who do not. And in this instance, quite fittingly, even the survivors are incorrectly assessed, whilst the perished are unashamedly disregarded. Suitably born out of the terror of war, the survivorship bias fallacy is an all too common logical error in our processing, where one assumes the success of any given story colours the entire canvas, dismissing all the thousands of illustrations, doodles and drawings that ended up in the trash bin along the way. Reportedly of all small business ventures, 50% of them fail within the first year and 95% go kaput within the first five. It seems the out of sight, out of mind approach we adopt when it comes to survival bias is intriguingly mirrored by the literal outcomes of businesses too. We're only privy to the ones that make it. In an almost conspiratorial form of toxic positivity, both the player and let's say the fan enter an agreement of convenient and dichotomous thinking, failing to register all those who fail as if life can really be what you will it to be. The consumer can be somewhat forgiven here, however, since losers become nothing more than a statistic. As is noted in Nicholas Taleb's Black Swan, the impact of the highly improbable, those who tend to an active problem, say a stock market crash, are often rewarded with bonuses and the like, but those who take pains to avoid such a catastrophe in the first place are not only never rewarded, but usually remain in obscurity. After all, there's no face to put to a name you've never heard of, to a disaster that never occurred. In all likelihood too, no one really wants to consider the high probability of their own future failure. It's much easier to indulge the fantasy that one day, good things will come, and you'll be just like the winners adorning your social media feeds than it is to go it alone and create your own path. For really, especially when it comes to creative endeavours, that path is a no man's land of unknown territory. And for those who do, the storytelling trope of the hero's journey is gonna kick your sorry ass to boot. The Hero's Journey is a storytelling pattern so deeply embedded in our psyches that I need not explain it. But for the sake of argument, it involves a protagonist who, thrusted out of his or her usual environment beyond their control, embarks on a quest facing challenges and obstacles along the way to ultimately achieving some sort of goal or victory. 
The hero will encounter allies and enemies, whether real or imaginary, or indeed his or herself, undergo a personal transformation which previously held them back, to return home with new knowledge or wisdom, where their environment has changed little except through how it is now perceived by our hero. The concepts of the hero's journey was first introduced by Joseph Campbell in his book The Hero with a Thousand Faces, published in 1949, a book of which I've read and can safely say is dull as shit. It's one of those books where the ideas contained within are far more interesting than the dense way in which they are explored in the text. It felt as if Campbell was trying to force his monomyth idea into every culture's myths and make it universal, all with the psychoanalytical approach very much in line with its times. And the structure of the piece has about as much linearity as the diary of a madman. And a boring, insufferable madman at that, full of fancy jargon and discursive ramblings to disguise the fact that he's saying diddly fuck all. So, if you happen to suffer from insomnia, link is in the description. You are, so long as you're still breathing, the survivor of your own life. Therefore, your propensity toward logical error when it comes to the survivorship bias is heightened because at our core, be it innate or ingrained, nature or nurture, it is in cahoots with the hero's journey diatribe. This trope has been played out ad fucking nauseam, from the devoutly religious to the atheistic amongst us, to the point that it's virtually impossible not to have a teeny little suspicion that your life is also a journey, and you are, of course, its fucking hero. There's a reason it's by far the most popular storytelling technique. You'd think that since the so-called period of enlightenment, which has failed irrefutably by now, we would have eradicated any notion of heroes and villains, but consumer capitalism and societal rat races have only further embedded this very individual-oriented trait. I mean, what is Nietzsche's Ubermensch or Dostoevsky's Raskolnikov but an extension of the Christ-like figure, a literal god amongst men? You can take the man out of religion, but you cannot take religion out of the man. And shitty cash grab remakes aside, Virtually all Disney and Pixar films utilize the hero's journey technique to some degree or another. However, life is not a journey and you are not your own hero. In all likelihood, you're your own worst enemy. There's such a, a desperate sense of entitlement, isn't it? Surely this is all for me. Me? Me, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm so fucking important. I'm so fucking important, right? You don't mm. fuck you. Just for a second. When it comes to memory itself, you're even your own worst enemy too since it behooves and facilitates the ego to be very selective about how it perceives itself. Ergo, the image or impression you have of yourself isn't likely to include all of the times you acted like a colossal twat, nor when you sinned or acted out of transgression. We tend to remember things, especially certain events, in fragments as it is and every time said fragments are recalled, they're being remembered from the last time you remembered it. Over time, this is a little like removing the pieces of a completed puzzle, but remembering it as if it's still full, only that the puzzle itself shrinks that little bit more upon each and every recollection. Quite fittingly too, I'd assume, the mind doesn't want to recall all of the failures and misguided steps one took on the way to the top, 
opting instead to perceive it as a natural evolution of all their hard work and simply part of the parcel that is their glorious I. I am God! 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 <laughs> <laughs> One would imagine Lana Del Rey has minimal recollection of her initial bid for pop stardom as Lizzie Grant, for example. And so would the internet too, it conveniently seems. Point being, we tend to forget our forays into ventures unwon. After all, most people postpone pursuing their dreams for their entire lives out of fear of this potential humiliation. And whilst I understand that, not being remembered for fear of failing to be remembered still makes you a far bigger pussy than those who at least give it a crack. But holding oneself back simply won't wash. Stephen Pressfield documented as such in his piece, The War of Art, describing how many a person becomes revivified toward their passion after being diagnosed with a terminal illness. So get a crack in before you drop dead. Because you will, you know, one day die. You will die. Probably a horrible, painful death, surrounded by bored relatives who are only there to secure their inheritance, wishing you just hurry the fuck up already and croak. Fear of failure is not the issue, it's fear of success. Primarily because of its carceral qualities, often making those at the top feel imprisoned by the product of their success, but also because one is forced to leave their old life behind, whereas those who fail at least get to maintain their freedom. This is why, in my assertion admittedly, some folks self-sabotage when at the top, possibly out of imposter syndrome, but also out of resentment for their success. Given the halo effect treatment, would it not stand to reason for someone like JK Rowling to suddenly chime in on her views about topics such as transgenderism, when really, why should anyone give a shit what a children's author has to say about such a thing to begin with? These types of incidents are passive aggressive forms of self-sabotage, where one takes it out on those, in this instance the audience, who imprisoned them into the positions they now stand. You could also look at it as a type of enforced death, where the person in question has to reevaluate themselves and their new station in life which is probably why the James Cordons of this world Hello? turn into the most insufferable pricks known to man <coughs> when kissed by the trapdoor of fame. Hence fear of success being far more prevalent than fear of failure. The latter may be humiliating, but the former can wreak havoc with your very identity. <laughs> To me, the survivorship bias is also analogous to seeing the trees for the forest, confusing the map for the territory, or perhaps most fittingly, only ever seeing the tip of the iceberg. Whilst the notion of not being able to see all the work that went into the tip is a valid one, it cannot give a visual representation of all those who worked just as hard only to have their tip melt or never reach above water in the first place. Similarly to the military planes in our fucking smashing intro, we're unable to see those who never return or fail to materialize. There's a phrase reserved for millennials of my generation, targeted at men mostly, at having failed to launch. This, whilst generally depicting men who still live with their parents well into their 30s, 
often labelled NEATS, again ascribes to an idea that the reason a man fails in life is due to his own lack of effort, whilst for the most part, completely ignoring the huge stack of odds against him, especially if he comes from a low income or less educated background and has zero connections or network to speak of, not to mention if he's short, fat and ugly. Losing the genetic lottery comes with a whole host of other societal losses to boot, and today, even the average man, as is attested to by those winners out there, is simply not enough. Like all areas of the self-help industry, and funnily enough, the beauty industry too, honing in on your insecurities is the key to their bottom line. For those who know they're inferior to some degree and brainwashed by the hero's journey hokum are naturally far more susceptible to falling for the snake oil salesman's bullshit. You might know deep down that you're not special, but shunning the idea that you secretly are is a far more difficult or cold hard truth to swallow. You'll be better off thinking of the chances of success as akin to the probability of still knowing the friends you made at school as you get older. The majority of people you once knew are destined to become precisely that, people you used to know. When we're thrown out into the brutal nature of the world, very few of us are ever seen again. Even those who do make it are not really what you see either, since many a famous person simply becomes a persona of their name, brand or image. They're a franchise, essentially. So what you see is not what they are. For instance, supermodel Emily Ratchikowski confessed in her book, My Body, that she only has sex if she can see herself in front of a mirror, quote, to see that I'm real, as if completely divorced from the idea of herself and the person she really is. And whilst every man on the planet would be eager to join her in the bedroom, once she goes all Patrick Bateman on your ass, I'm not sure how many would remain so keen. I mean, They'd likely soldier on regardless. Look at her. But it'd probably dampen the experience somewhat. Even Emily naming her book My Body is pretty confessional, as if openly admitting that nobody gives a shit what she has to say, or her ghostwriter, unless it's about her figure. Based. Take also Jeremy Meeks the crook turned supermodel whose rise to fame involved him getting arrested for gang affiliation and the Californian police posting his mugshot to Facebook for some reason, only for social media to make him go viral. I'm telling you guys, anything is possible. Don't ever get up, keep, keep grinding, keep hustling, shoot for your dreams. You can do anything you want, I'm, I promise you. You just have to take that first step, take that hard step of actually doing something. This dumbass twat actually believes that dreams come true because the world told him so, rewarding him for illegal behavior essentially, merely because of how he appears. Crime pays if you're fuckable, or if looks could kill, you'd get away with murder when it comes to the human race. Being possessed with good looks is a literal get out of jail free card. And now Meeks has even fallen for the cliched nonsense people spout when they're trying to flog you their worthless products and bullshit courses. But what if, in fact, you do make it? 
After all, somebody's got to, right? Why should you give a shit about this if you're the lucky one? Well, it could ruin your life, for one thing, or you could become an insufferable prick as well. Ain't that right, James Corden? When I first heard about it myself, I assumed the survivorship fallacy was somewhat apropos and adopted from survivorship guilt. But it appears I was wrong. However, I still feel guilt does still occupy a seat in the mind of the successful. Where a person who turned out to be the sole, often unscathed survivor of an otherwise fatal catastrophe would be troubled by immense feelings of guilt and unworthiness, a person who succeeds in the modern day rat race appears to flip that guilt into a sense of pride instead, if not of their being of divine sovereignty, coming to believe that the steps they took to reach the top can simply be replicated, especially if they plan on flogging it on their crappy website. The curbing of the ego is cognitive dissonance, actively turning the screw. Ergo, the if I can do it, anyone can crap, turns a deliberate blind eye to all those who took the same steps, if not surpassing them, only to end up in a no man's land of the entrepreneurial wilderness. The ego, admittedly trying to cope, opts for the hubristic or even deific in order to deal with their monumental fucking luck. Because if they admit to it being mainly down to fortune, they don't have to confront the guilt of slipping through the cracks of a system that is 99% rigged against them. Whilst the adage of working hard for what you get is a commendable one, the complete delusion of a meritocracy is only further exacerbated by these horseshit success stories. They say you should never look a gift horse in the mouth. Same goes for ever listening to the horseshit that spews out of the mouth of the insurmountably lucky. In order to accept abnormal success, you have to convince yourself that you either achieved it out of your own merit or that you were destined to do so. In my mind, it's a convenient combination of both. After all, it would hardly behoove the player to play it cool and act with humility. For a sucker to be born every minute, they've got to convince their audience that whatever stature they've reached in life is, of course, attainable. Otherwise, their courses on Skillshare or Ponzi scheme, oh, <clears throat> sorry, Hustlers University courses would never make a dime. Paving a path to the dream of many is itself a lucrative business model, especially if your audience ain't all that bright. But someone's story is never a blueprint to success, especially if they're selling said fucking story. In some ways, the con artist's greatest trick is first convincing themselves of their fate and believing the commodification of it is entirely justified or they know it's total bullshit and are willingly flogging manure, which I'm sure is the case for quite a few. But even those guys likely come to believe in their own myth, despite it being a fabrication of their very own design, or just stolen from a popular piece of media and rehashed to suit the snake oil salesman's agenda. We are living inside of the matrix and I am Morpheus. Signing up to Hustlers University for a recurring $50 a month is equivalent to spending all of your money on lottery tickets because some dude who won it previously told you to do so. After all, it worked for him, didn't it? That's logic you cannot refute, mate. Regardless of the over-fucking-whelming odds against you ever winning the jackpot yourself. Just like ever becoming a millionaire by drop shipping junk from Ali fucking Express. 
I mean, and I can't quite believe I'm going to say this, but well, here we are. At least Belle Dufine and the bottles of used bubble bath water was honest. The guys who bought it knew exactly what she was selling. In fact, you could probably argue that her advertising campaign there to be the most honest piece of marketing in the history of consumer capitalism. She bottled it and the suckers bought it, hook, line and sinker, knowing full well she'd sat there farting away in the tub. It's theorised, and if you want to take anything away from this video, here it is, that most of the guys who bought Bell's bathwater are misophiliacs. Misophilia, for those who don't know, is a pathological attraction to dirt and filth. So they didn't buy the water because it was blessed by Bell's coochie little tush, but more because it was soiled by it. To sum up, the reason the survivorship bias will always be at large is because logic just doesn't fit well within the societal narrative at play. As any economist will tell you, human beings are not rational creatures. A person who makes it, conceding it was all dumb luck and nothing more, aligns themselves or puts themselves in cahoots with determinism. In a sense, it was always going to happen, but the person it happened to had no part in it whatsoever. And that don't sit well with westernised, individually driven folk because it suggests your fate is out of your hands. You can hardly achieve self actualization if actually there is no self to actualize in the first place. But, I mean, you can believe Kylie Jenner is a self-made billionaire if you want to. Maybe believing that will help you manifest your best life. You are the universe, after all, ain't ya? Or, if you keep your fingers crossed, one day you'll fall straight out of the right vagina.